as indeed they were, the marrow washed away in the preparation of the specimens. Their surface was porous, full of tiny holes and crevices, rough in places where I was to learn muscles had attached during life. I named my bones Charles. As I fingered the landmarks and imperfections, I couldn't shake my disbelief that these were real human bones. I felt proud yet awed by the tremendous responsibility bestowed upon me with this battered wooden box. As we investigated our bone boxes, we studiously ignored the bulbous shapes that lay draped in dull white sheets on four stainless steel hip high tables along the periphery of the room. These were the cadavers we would be dissecting, but nobody mentioned them, even as we each snuck furtive glances around the room. In, in high school back in Poland, I had heard stories about medical students fainting upon seeing the first cadaver or running out of the dissection room and never coming back. Was that going to happen to me? Well, are you ready? Our demonstrator asked. So um, when I was asked to participate in this panel on science, I was kind of wondering about how could I get myself into it? Because I'm not really a basic scientist and I don't write about basic science. By basic science, I mean people who actually do the experiments and do the uh, trials and, and write big papers and publish amazing work on basic science. I'm a clinical scientist. I do research in clinics. So what I write about is, is medicine. However, I have heard some wonderful uses. And as, as Madura had mentioned, metaphor can benefit so tremendously from the scientific language and from the science that we know. And one of the most amazing and not my own uh, uses of a metaphor using a biological um, um, construct was to think of uh, telling stories as transmission of biological signals across the membranes. And the membrane stands for ignorance. So what you have is in order to get an information from one cell to another across the membrane, you get a ligand that gets caught onto a receptor, then it gets flipped onto the other side of the, of the um, membrane and the other cell gets that information. So just the same way as people are separated by the membranes of ignorance, the stories act like the ligands that come from one of us to the other one across the membrane to change us and affect change. I wish it was my own idea, but it was, it was one of my mentors that I quote a lot in my book, Rita Sharon, that came up with this idea. And I just thought I would share it with you here. Thank you. Oh, that's so splendid. <laughs> oh, a tough act to follow, Krista. <laughs> Would you like to introduce Half-Life to us? They're both tough acts to follow, but thank you so much for uh, those readings, Matter and, and Margaret. Yeah, so my, my book is a novel, and it's about a middle-aged high school physics teacher named Ellen Henriksen. And she's a single mom. She's got a frail, um, aging mother. She has two accomplished siblings who are coming back um, to reunite with her, and, and they're all hurtling toward a quite an explosive reunion. And the, and the stress of this has caused Ellen to, to reach out to basically imagine herself talking to Niels Bohr, that he's under a copper beech tree outside of her high school physics room classroom. So she's having conversations with him. She believes she has a relationship with him, and that's part of the, the story of the book. So I'm just going to read a short passage. Um, one of the things about Alan is that she's a frustrated theoretical physicist is what she wanted to be. Um, and so I'm taking you into a flashback in which she gets thwarted by a professor uh, who she greatly admires. Um, so here we go. Physicists are like gymnasts, Professor Higgs says. You take a group of gymnasts, all young, and most of them will work hard, expect to compete at an elite level. But only if you make it. Hard work and ambition, yeah, they're required, but it's not enough. An elite gymnast has a genetic predisposition, a body type, innate flexibility, which recognized early and exploited with all the right attention at the right time will, will blossom. Most elite physicists are the same. Somebody noticed something about them early, supplies that attention. I'm guessing that hasn't been your experience, Ms. Henriksen. 
did I fail my paper, professor? No, you did okay, but just okay. This last word landed like a life sentence. Ellen shifted in her chair. She'd left Betts in the cafeteria with a young woman, a polymath on a full scholarship whom she'd met in her biological physics seminar, and who'd informed Ellen with a preferred sibling's assurance that among her many exuberant talents was a natural connection to children. They were eating tater tots and building bridges with takeout coffee cups when Ellen, en route to Higgs' office, glanced back. I've sacrificed a lot to be here to do this degree, Ellen said. She wondered if he could raise a small child alone while paying the bills, completing advanced thermodynamics, and submitting an okay contemporary interpretations of quantum mechanics paper. On time, after working to the morning's wee hours at a downtown bar, she wondered if he was the kind of man who would call a woman flighty and never be able to see her in any other way. Even if it turned out she not only had a genetic predisposition for this subject, but that she had bloodlines that tied her to the best generation of physicists who were also the most destructive so far. He pulled himself back to his desk, leaned on his elbows, softened his expression. So it read like a sympathy card blandishment. She noted the flakes of dandruff along the part of his hair, the faintly zinctious hue of his skin, the deep labial ruts of his smile. Have you considered teaching at the secondary level? I'd be happy to write a reference letter for you. There are so few women teaching physics in high school. What a role model you'd be. And think you could give the extra attention to someone who doesn't yet realize the level of her own talent. Ellen stood up, her chair skittered backwards. Thank you, but I don't need a reference to go to teacher's college. Professor Hicks stood also, held out his turkey mustard hand to shake. She imagined the nitrate tingle of luncheon meat and mustard wean weaning pungency on his palm. She nodded, but did not extend hers. So that's my reading. So where do I come into the picture of uh, science? Um, for me, I, I grew up as a bug collecting nature nerd in a house of artists. I uh, betrayed everybody to house, house of derision when I actually went into um, engineering in my undergraduate years. And much to my family's delight, I um, had a disastrous <laughs> go in that program um, and switched to, uh, to economics. And I was always struggling with the, the two silos, the arts and the, and the sciences in my life. When I ended up as a journalist at a major a national newspaper, I had the lovely opportunity to cover um, science. I did a lot of covering um, you know, the journals like Nature, things that were coming up, talking to a lot of scientists and it rekindled the fire uh, for me. So, so my inner nerd was sort of all fired up again. And so fiction for me has been kind of the perfect marriage. It allows me to, to basically have both, to, uh, to think in terms of science while not understanding it, anywhere near in the depth of people who have the academic background, but also to think um, to think in terms of the artistry and to merge them. So that's that's my story. That's terrific. That word silo is something that you hear a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what we all think about the idea that there are arts and sciences and that they're separate. Do you think that, um, that that's a fair statement? Is that, um, you know, to what extent is that true? And to what extent do we want to change it? Anybody? If you guys want to raise your hands, I'll call on you. <laughs> Barbara. Well, that's something that is actually quite important to me. Um, I am involved in the field uh, called narrative medicine, where medical students and physicians are taught slash encouraged to read literary works, not genre fiction, but literary works uh, in order to foster empathy. And, you know, in the olden days, and I'm not going to call them the good old days because they necessarily were not, um, people were supposed to have been trained in humanities as well as sciences before they applied into, into medicine. And, and it was just as important to have a good um, grasp of, you know, ancient history and the classics. Uh, that has gotten lost in the technol technologization of, of our, our medicine and, and narrative medicine strives to make people more sensitive and more empathetic by reading literary fiction. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that I strongly support and actually a big part of 
in my memoir is deals with with narrative medicine and how it has helped me and that it can help many other people yeah. so we're when trying was, to breach the silos when i was reading your memoir i was like i know a neurologist or two that could benefit from a <laughs> a solid dose of empathy um that's really an interesting argument you usually hear it the other way around that um most um people don't know enough about science, but is it also true that most scientists or some scientists don't know enough about the arts? I've got practicing scientists over here. I'll, I'll call on Mater for that one. What do you think? Sorry, on me? No, on Mater. Madur, yeah. Madur, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My working on name. Um, um, well, I mean, I can't speak for all of science, right? Sure, you <laughs> all of science. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, of course, there are silos. I mean, one thing that is 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 you know, I guess I'm one of the relatively few um, people who is a practicing scientist and a practicing artist. So um, I have to fight with that at times, just like within my own uh like my corpus callosum is, all, is very uh uh active <laughs> and um so i do have to fight fight with that within my own um personhood slash identity um uh, many of us have have multiple identities uh it's not necessarily new um but uh yeah so that's that's something that is constantly a challenge, but I would say that it's not a challenge in and of itself intrinsically that the, the uh, you know, there's so many commonalities in the processes of arts and sciences that um, it's I'm the same person right I'm essentially the same person doing both things. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulties come when um, uh, to externalize uh, everything right because we have these silos in society and in our in our institutions uh pretty much everywhere and it, it's 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 broad it's it's sweeping and um and it's a problem because we do have you know lack of understanding of what scientists do and currently we have a huge like crisis and um like you know it, believing in scientists or whatever the politicizing of, of science and so on so it, it can be really problematic um on the other hand um uh yeah and and it's it's, it's sad because like you said at the beginning science belongs to everybody and I, I i absolutely think that that's true and um the portrayals of scientists uh, wearing white coats doesn't help anybody uh, <laughs> with that. Um, now, you asked, though, whether scientists should be, you know, more trained in the arts and so on. I mean, I don't like to use the, the, the should and, and could, but yeah, um, certainly I will tell you the answer that I received from somebody who won a Nobel Prize in science, Roald, Hoff, Roald Hoffman, I don't know if you know him, he's a theoretical chemist, retired, but he won a Nobel Prize for his science. And he also writes poetry. And I asked him what he thought, what first of all, why he wrote and what he what he thought he thought in general that scientists could gain from poetry. And, and he did say empathy. So mm. we have uh, some agreement here. <laughs> between two out of the three panelists so far. <laughs> what do you think, Krista? Well, I'm all for empathy. <laughs> <laughs> for empathy. Yeah. Am I gonna take a bold stance against empathy? <laughs> no. I mean, I can't, I can't speak to it. I can't speak to it in the way Margaret and, and Matter can because I'm, I'm not coming from that um, context, but um, I can say that when I was a journalist and I was talking to a lot of scientists, um, the ones who, who seemed to be the best communicators definitely were ones who had a sense of metaphor. So they, they got it from somewhere, but I mean, communicating science is a huge issue, right? And if, um, and so the scientists that I talked to who were, who were just able to get their point across were often speaking 
quite lyrically and quite with a lot of metaphor. And I really, I mean, that was always super impressive and made my job a lot easier. Yeah, personally speaking, I like the ones who have thought up a metaphor for me already. The one thing I will say about working at Perimeter is it's the only place I've ever worked that has a staff like chamber orchestra. It's one of our recreational things that we have is just a chamber orchestra. I don't know if they're good because I have the ears of a tin rabbit, but it's always been interesting to me how many scientists are interested in music and photography and arts and how little that fits in with the stereotype of what science that should be interested in. So I think perhaps, yeah, Margaret. Well, as we were talking about it, I mean, I was thinking about the, 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 the quintessential scientist. Mm -hmm. To me, it was Leonardo da Vinci. Oh. Can I, do I need to say any more? <laughs> you've got the artist, you've got the scientist, you've got, you've got the inquiring mind, you've got the mm -hmm. pioneer. I mean, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on behind those scientists or physicians' brains that is maybe not appreciated. Yeah, I think it's perhaps a little less siloed than it sometimes looks from the outside. Yeah, I hope so anyway. Although uh, I, I do going to take your memoir and the whole idea of narrative fiction and give it to my neurosurgeon, if you don't mind. He could use it. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what drew us to, when people find out that I have a background in physics and also that I write science fiction, they say, oh, that must be so handy. And it's not, it's not at all. Science fiction, um, actually, you know, it's just a, it's just a piece of set dressing. And I certainly know how to do research, but it really is the smallest of my skill sets. My science informs my poetry to a much greater extent um, and not in obvious ways, but in ways that like reward paying close attention, for example. So I wanted to talk about the different ways in which science can be used to fuel creativity besides writing science fiction or doing what I do, which is you know actually explaining science to the general public. What are some other modalities? What are other pieces? that people are interested in trying or that have, have worked well for you. Krista, do you want to start that one? We'll go sure. Sure. across the board. Um, I think I know that with this, with this novel, you know, science provided a lot of thematic mirroring so that, that Alan has, uh, the main character has a personal struggle with the idea of truth. She's seeking truth. She's seeking truth in a, and, and for a, around a personal trauma, she's seeking truth around other narratives within the family. And science is like this perfect mirror for that because you know science is a sort of truth seeking um, enterprise is perfect because it also comes up against and stumbles on the same things that, that Alan stumbles on, which is paradox and contradiction um, and constants that work and the constants that don't work, the fallibility of the, of the question and the framing. And all of those things um, become super interesting you know, to me as a writer. Um, if they can reverberate around a character's personal struggle too. So I think there's that. I also think there's um, the beauty of creating a voice that has uh, partly a scientific uh, le lexicon. So you can create a, a wonderful sort of voice in terms of just the way you use that. So Alan, again, um, she names, uses the Latin names for plants, but she also knows the folk names. She thinks about, she walks down a busy hallway with a cup of coffee and she's thinking about the peak amplitudes of that coffee moving in the cup. She's thinking about the rates of probability of bumping into her boss when she's late. So she thinks, you know, selectively in scientific ways, um, and that helps to inform a voice and create a kind of, um, you know, a quirkiness and also to just have her inhabit a world of curiosity. So those are the two ways that I would say that, that works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Madra, what do you think? Uh... Yeah, those are great examples. Um, any number of ways. Um, structures, you know. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about structures. Like, to what extent are you I, wondering about like symmetry in a book that's literally split down the middle and is two mirror images? 
Is yeah. that where you started? In or? fact, it's not, it's not metric. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yes, of course there's a mirror image there. I oh, know, but, um, mm -hmm. but um, I actually worked a lot more with asymmetry, uh, mm -hmm. which is a structure as well. Um, uh, and, and the, you know, the, 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 there, there are many, many thematics and, and metaphors around um, symmetry, symmetry breaking, mm -hmm. uh, what causes it. Um, it, it it's, um, and, and, you know, how it manifests at so many different levels from the evolution of the human heart to um, the splitting apart of uh, nations through arbitrary geographic uh, borders violently mm -hmm. so um yes yeah, so, so structures i mean i've i i the book is called this red line goes straight to your heart but the probably the type of line that you should imagine when reading it is a fractal line so it's another kind mm -hmm. of structure that uh is present and many literary works i think follow that type of structure um, it's a very natural, organic structure for um, processes that are um, that have multiple voices and or uh, are meaningful at many different scales. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think literature is is well uh, matched to that. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of other structures. I used um, a, a, an idea, the idea of turbulent flow mm -hmm. in, in fluid dynamics, um, because um, again, originally, like the, the book was, uh, came out of uh, my desire to write about my parents after my mother had a heart attack. So I played a lot with the idea of lines and flows and hearts and turbulence and, um, yeah, so that's another kind of structure that's really interesting. And the thing about uh, scientific structures is that, um, and, and this is very much related to the idea of metaphor, is that you can have um, wildly different, I use the word wild, I, I was, uh, I just noticed in all the promo for the wild writers, um, you, they use all different uh, versions of the word wild. <laughs> uh, wildly different uh, phenomena uh, can have very similar structures, right? This is this concept of universality in, in mm -hmm. science and, and complex systems theory. So, um, so there's that as well. And one of those examples is, is turbulent flow. And um, yeah, I could probably go on a very long time. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I want to hear what Margaret says. Yeah, I want to hear what Margaret says too. Margaret wants to hear what Margaret says too. <laughs> uh, so, in my memoir, my the, the the structure was pretty straightforward. It's it's pretty much linear, forward moving with flashbacks when necessary to expand on things that are not obvious. But in my fiction writing and my short stories, I have explored a couple of of forms that I have um, borrowed from my my field. One is a braided essay. And thinking of it as sort of as a DNA DNA spiral and enhancing it and and uh, they are, they enhance each other as they twist around. Um, so that was one uh, for nonfiction writing, and the other one was uh, the uh, idea of a nested story. Um, and a nested story is when a story starts is interrupted, another story starts is interrupted, another story starts you can keep going and then that story finishes and then you go back and you finish that story and you go back and you finish that story. And the best example of that is Cloud Atlas, uh, Dave Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, which is exactly that story. So I tried to do that, but I decided to give it a bit of a twist. And I said, okay, we're going to have the same thing. We're gonna have the nesting, but what is nested? What is the most, what is, what is nested? And I went, the fetus, the placenta, the mother, and then the doctor looking after the mother. And I sort of tried to, it hasn't quite worked out. I've been working on this story for quite a while, <laughs> but that was my idea of, of a nested story because what is more nested than a fetus in a womb in the mother, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my idea, uh, sort of using structure from biology to for my, for my fiction. Mm -hmm. 
oh, you guys make me want to start writing poetry about half lives and oh, it's I I thought we might have something interesting to say about structure, but this is so wonderful. What about poet? What about science as a source of metaphor or lexicon? Is anyone interested in exploring that kind of thing? I am going to say something, um, but it's going to be, beat not my own drum, but my favorite poet's drum, which is uh, Wisława Szymborska, who is a Nobel Prize winner from 2000 and no, 1996. And she is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant poet. And a lot of her uh, inspiration comes from biology and the natural world. And it's just mind boggling, mind, mind, mind boggling. And um, if you, yeah, I'm, I, if, I'm just going to restrain myself because I could just jump into my bookshelf and start <laughs> reading her translations, which are not as good as Polish, let me tell you. But, but if you want to have some fantastic, oh, exactly the same book at the back there. <laughs> Um, Mine's inside, but I have it yeah, too. <laughs> I mean, if you want to read some superb use of metaphors from the natural word world, read Shamborska because she's she'll just take your breath away. Mm -hmm. I'm not a poet. I've never written I've written three poems in my life. Three, three poems in my life. So I'm not gonna speak to that. Is anyone interested in um in science as a source of, I'm, I was trying to come up with a master metaphor for this, um, simply for social media to say, you know, these are women who are mining science for, or using science as fuel for, and I was unhappy with all of those. Does anyone have a good one? How, what is our relationship between science and creative work? I know metaphor. Nourished by it. Nourished by it, yeah. It's the soil in which we grow. No. That is much better than mining. <laughs> yeah. Um, I keep talking, who's ever talking? Yeah, it's just, I don't know. There's some, I think that it's just, you're, you're, I think. We're set up for failure. The, the, the question is posed not quite right because I think um, if you have to explain a metaphor, it's, it's not working, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so just using the language. I mean, I think one thing that um, I find interesting, maybe this is gonna take us on a, in a different direction, but um, uh, there's the language and the, le the lexicon of it, which um, is, you know, is, is, is illuminating, is rich, is beautiful sometimes in its own right. A lot of those words are, are beautiful, um, precise, uh, and, you know, coincidentally metaphoric at times because you, you words used colloquially, um, have can be used with in a in, in a different context with it with very different um, meaning in science right like the word partition for example uh, there's a mathematical theory of partition which you know is nothing like well that's the thing that's the question <laughs> um, does it have anything yeah. to do with the partition of India mm -hmm. probably not but it can, but probably also yes, because mathematics um, is its own language, and and uh, so why not? Um, you know, and that's I think what we all what we do as writers, right? We 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 create new language and new mm -hmm. new, new structures, and um, so I think that that and and we use it using uh, you know a variety of lexicon lexicons lexica. Um, and so, yeah, there's that. But th there's also the culture of science as well, which is in addition to just the terminology and words and mm -hmm. terms, which I think um, needs more exploring, like, in, a, in for, you know, in science communication, but also in literature. Yeah. Um, and this kind of it comes, you know, back to what Krista was saying about how it it fascinated her as a writer to have a character, uh, uh, you know, encounter the 
inconsistencies and uncertainties associated with with science. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's something that I think maybe some others can maybe speak about is is this um, this weird thing. In fact, that the, the moment I began writing poetry was in 1996, the year that Wyslava Saborska won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that because that was the first book of poems that I went and bought. Oh. Because um, that's the year I started to write a poem and I had no clue what I was doing or what poetry was. And I went to the bookstore. Well, then I looked around me and I thought, well, where should I start? And she won the Nobel Prize that year. So I started there. Lucky me, right? Because lucky mm -hmm. because of what you said. Anyway, um, yeah, it was a, I was finishing up my PhD, which should have been a moment where I was achieving some sort of certainty about my knowledge base, about being a scientist, but um, I started to become suddenly very, very uncertain about everything. So I think that 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 could be something to to discuss, and it's something that I think has in common with with poetry and literature. Mm -hmm. I could just you know jump in because I think it's interesting to to think about creativity also as sort of in an antagonistic relationship a bit with science, as it should be, right? It should be questioning the framing of science, the Eurocentrism of science, the narratives of science particularly um, that, that need to be put up to the light, especially around um, ideas, you know, mythologies of genius and all that kind of stuff that happens in the scientific world. So I think there, I think the role of, you know, you know, originally you had framed the question around, well, what is creativity's relationship or role with, with science? And I think on some level, you know, there's the in love with it and also on the other level that, you know, on the other side of it, it should be slightly antagonistic. It should be questioning um, all the time, I think. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock and I see that we're about ready to hit the 45 minute mark and hopefully open this up for questions from the audience. Um, which I hope people can type in the chat box, but I don't see anything up there yet. So if you're out there listening in internet land and you have questions, uh, please type them in chat and we'll try to keep an eye on them. But in the meantime, here's a question coming off of uh, antagonism a little bit and the culture of science. This is framed or advertised as a panel of women writing about science. What does it mean to be a woman writing about science? Is that important at all? Are we still outsider voices? Historically, at least in Western settler culture here in North America, uh, we've been excluded and are still largely underrepresented. Um, is that something that, that comes into each of your work? I'm gonna put somebody on the spot here. Margaret. Any, mini, miny, mo. It's it could be a very long, uh, long answer, but I was quite surprised, not having been a militant feminist. Although somebody could say that uh, I am a militant feminist by by the mere na nature of being in medical school, a physician, and and all of those things, to find myself writing what turned out to be quite a militantly feminist essay. And it was, uh, it, it was supposed to, um, it, it, was, it was an assignment in my MFA class, which was to pick a date in history and to write about five events that happened on that day. And we had to do the research for that, whatever it was. So I picked the day which uh, I picked the 25th of April, 1953, which Maduro probably knows is the day that the structure of uh, DNA was first published. And what most women know is that that structure was published by two men, Watson and Crick, and it's always been the Watson and Crick model of the DNA, and everybody conveniently forgot Rosalind Franklin. And as I was writing this essay, and I, I had some uh, other um, 
things that happen on that day around the world. I ended up with with the uh, with the description of the very short. It, it was a, a letter to the editor. It wasn't even a, a proper scientific paper. It was a letter to the editor, and then I found myself writing about with with quite. I, I to my surprise, like I was pissed off. I was getting pissed off. I was getting angry as I was writing about Rosalind Franklin being cheated out of her Nobel Prize. Um, well, actually not out of a Nobel Prize, but out of the actual credit in the original letter. Mm -hmm. Because if it wasn't for that photograph 53 or 54, I, I forget the, no the, no the number now, they would have never discovered the structure of the DNA. Yet they gave her no credit at all, very little credit, just in a postscript to the paper. So, um, being a woman in medicine, writing about it, as, as I said, I never thought of myself when I was writing my medical papers and my and, and my scientific papers. Never thought of myself as being a woman in medicine. But when I was writing a nonfiction essay, it came out. And then, as I look at my stories, they're very there, there's something to it. And, and again, I think it's just coming out honestly, as opposed to put on as as a facade. Mm -hmm. Our only question from the audience is from our, for our some uh, Zimborska fans about which book should they start with? <laughs> um, well, you know what I'll do is uh, basically any. The one that Madur showed is a, is a very good translation and was the very first book of, of hers that was published in English and translation by Claire Kavanaugh. But there are also other translations, more recent ones. and. Um, what I will do is I can, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but there's plenty of them um, mm -hmm. that have been translated in, into, into English and they're bilingual uh, publications uh, out of Poland that you can get any of her, any of her poems. That one is a very good sort of cross section of, of her, of her over, oeuvre, whatever you go, <laughs> whatever way you say it. <laughs> yeah. We have a question so for Margaret and Mater. Did you ever consider leaving science to become a full-time writer? Or do you love science too much? No. No. No, I would, I would, uh, um, no, I'm a doctor who writes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a writer who doctors. I'm very proud of being a writer and I worked very hard on, on becoming that later in life. But my first identity is a physician. Mm -hmm. I do all the time, <laughs> uh, but I don't even know what it would mean. I really don't know what it would mean to do it. Um, yeah, I, the, I mean, I, I, I do all the time now. I, I didn't previously, and I think I do all the time now only because I have, um, uh, I've written prose. I've written something that is really long and has a lot you know in its prose and um and it and it took a very different kind of uh time commitment i guess than poetry does so poetry does seem to be able to you know fit in the little space uh yeah uh and whereas prose uh, i think is is really is, is different so i i i i i'm quite terrified about you know, being able to write more prose books, uh, given everything else that I do. Um, but um, yeah, so it might still happen. But um, then again, um, it's, I think rather than um, forcing myself to make that choice, which I think would just be um, the wrong thing to do, uh, in a way, because for, for me, um, uh, that I, I really need to work hard at um, at trying to 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 continue being both, and perhaps find um, more ways to integrate the two into my life and into like onto the academic side, for example. So. Um, I've just introduced a course into our undergraduate cur curriculum. I I'm in a school of environmental sciences, so there's no, um, it's science. <laughs> uh, it's not studies, it's science. And uh, 
So, um, but um, I've introduced a new course that, uh, you know, went through all the processes and channels and um, seems to be accepted now. So it's an environmental science undergraduate course called Creative Writing for Environmental Scientists. And I'll be teaching that for the first time next, uh, in this winter. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of questions here about research, uh, including one directed specifically to Krista about researching her book. And someone else who wants to know if you're writing about science, how do you go about making sure that it's accurate? What are your tips for that? Particularly for those of us who are writing a long way from home. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things I think if you're not, if you don't have a background with it is to avoid hubris. And so <laughs> also avoid like, you can kind of panic and think, okay, if I'm writing about this um, as a fiction writer, I have to know everything, uh, especially so I can sound like I know what I'm talking about, but you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't do what people who've been spending their whole lives in a, in a discipline have done in a matter of just, you know, cramming it in and, and, and reading, you know, everything you can get your hands on. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you'll understand everything conceptually. So you have to make some choices. You have to, uh, make some choices around and the ultimate thing is if you're writing fiction your first job job one is enchantment you have to enchant people and that's your and then you know and the science is part of that um so you learn as much as you can to make that work you ask for it to be vetted with as many people as possible um and i think you know and and that's what i did i mean with this book i you know i started kind of on a meandering course of reading about the hard question of consciousness and then backed into the physics and, and that way. So it was an interesting, it was sort of an interesting way into, into what I was became interested in. And some of it was pure serendipity. And I think you also have to be open to that. Mm -hmm. I just stumbled on a book while looking for something entirely different in the library and read it in a day. And then suddenly that also became part of the story. So mm -hmm. so I, I, I don't know if that's, there's no strict methodology in there, but it's just, I recognize that you won't know everything. Um, and that's also not your job as a fiction writer is to know everything that the scientist knows. My suggestion would be just, you know, always ask experts to vet, vet it out. And, and I do that too for like, even in my memoir, I was asking experts on stuff that I didn't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The ask people school of research is, is badly underrated in our age of Google. It's much better to talk to humans. Yeah, that's what I mostly do. Um, we're running out of time, but here's a nice short question. What is everyone's next writing project? Except for Margaret, who has a book birthday in two days and doesn't have to have a next one yet. <laughs> like my next project is rat launching my book. You guys want to hear about mine? Because I have a book coming out with um, with uh, Brick Books, which is actually finally my book of poetry about science and scientists and what's known and what's unknown and how we know and what we forget and what we remember. It's called A Knife So Sharp Its Edge Cannot Be Seen. Uh, there's a lot of archaeology and for some reason a lot of Marie Curie and um, radiation physics, hmm. in it, which is my particular background. So. Finally, I get to inflict radiation physics on the poetry reading audience of Canada. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited about it. Congratulations. So who else has got something new coming or something that, that is bubbling up? Um, I'm working on a book with entomology in it, going back Ooh. to my first love. Bugs. <laughs> so, Bugs. <laughs> Bugs is good. I always have to stop and remember if it's etymology or entomology. Every time someone mentions it, I get them mixed up. <laughs> so, Bugs is I good. Have, I have a book of poems coming out as well. Oh, uh, in wonderful. spring. Mm -hmm. I just received the first pages. I love that um, moment. Ago, I'm working on them. Now. I actually have to work on them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I I press a bit on my Encirc uh, 
discovery renewal <laughs> grant today. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of you know what that is, it's the it's the go to for academics for funding for research and it's um, we have to apply every five years for our research programs and it's um, it's nerve wracking every time and it's actually a work of art <laughs> at this point but um yeah and 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 so now i, I yeah i have a, a book of poems coming out in in spring oh and yeah. i am working on a collection of short stories i've been working on it for years and i'm still trying to find somebody that would like them enough to publish well perhaps there's someone out in our audience <laughs> somewhere who will reach out to us um, we have two minutes left. Does anyone want to throw out a random reading recommendation? We, we have obviously sold some Symborska, whose name I massacre differently every time I say it. I'm sorry to everyone in Poland. But um, I just finished uh, Susan Brindmaro um, has a new book and she's an Egyptologist and uh, someone who's interested in the history of language and in archaeology. And her new book is called, mm, I'm blanking on it. Her old book is called The Names of Things and it's my favorite book ever in terms of personal memoir about, um, about science. Mm. Anybody else? Throw one out there. Well, the overstory was pretty amazing about dendrology and trees and everything it was fabulous. Just finished reading it. I love the title of that. Yeah. I'm writing that one down. Is that all one word over story over over story? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's yay thick. It took me a long time to read it. Is it? Yeah, but it's, worth it. it's a beautiful book. I, I also loved the uh, it's about a year old, The Book of Eels, just as a nonfiction work in terms of just a natural history story. Mm -hmm. See, I'm, I'm scribbling busily as if I, I needed my pile beside my bed to go any higher. One of these days, that will be my cause of death. <laughs> <laughs> Hubris, as my child says, will get me in the end. Right. Well, I believe we are almost out of time. Um, I'm not sure if the wild writers are coming back to thank everyone and see us out. I think they are. Here they are. Hi. Well, I want to start by thanking all of you for such a wonderful talk. It's honestly been so fascinating to listen and learn from all of you. Uh, personally, I am someone who's been taught that sciences and arts don't go together and they don't mix. So like growing up and all that, so this has been amazing. Um, thank you so much again, Madhur, Erin, uh, Krista, and Margaret. Um, in closing, I want to remind our viewers that writers, but the writer's books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. Um, please visit our online book table for a handy overview of all our festival authors' books. And don't forget that the next World Writers Literary Festival event is from Plants to Pages, Helen Humphreys on Field Studies on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, thank you so much for attending tonight's event. And again, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, like, thank you. If we were all together, we'd all be clapping and possibly even standing ovations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, for your hosting. And uh, thank you. It was lovely sharing time with you, Margaret and Matter. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Krista, for the seed for this. <laughs> yes, Krista inspired this. Thank you for putting this together for us, Krista, and the New Quarterly for their tireless work on this festival and showcasing writers from our region. There's more writing than just lives in Toronto. So. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.